The third type of elementary matrices 2.0 that we want to talk about is how do you upgrade a replacement matrix? Uh, how are we going to generalize that? Well, this leads to the idea of triangular matrices, which there's going to be two types of triangular matrices we're going to talk about, which will then correspond to the fact there's really two types of replacement operations we are going to talk about. So the first one is what we call an upper triangular matrix. An upper triangular matrix is going to be a square matrix n by n. All of these matrices we've talked about so far are n by n square matrices. A upper triangular matrix is going to be a triangle. It's going to be a matrix so that all of the numbers below the diagonal are necessarily zero. And so, for example, an upper triangular matrix, you see something like this, that if you look at the numbers on the diagonal and above the diagonal, they can be whatever they want. They can be whatever they want, but the numbers below the diagonal have to be zero. And this is why we call it an upper triangular matrix, that the location of non-zero numbers is necessarily going to make this triangular shape. And that doesn't mean that the numbers above the diagonal have to be non-zero. They could be zero, too. That's okay. Uh, the zero matrix, for example, is an upper triangular matrix. Upper triangular just means that everything below the diagonal has to be zero. And in a, in, the, in the similar direction, a lower triangular matrix is going to be a matrix, square matrix, so that everything below the diagonal is, I should say everything above the diagonal is going to be zero. So the things above the diagonal have to be zero, but the things below it, they could be whatever they want. And so if you look for the non-zero numbers, this is going to be forming this uh, lower triangular region. This is why we call them upper triangular and lower triangular uh, for these reasons right here. But of course, the numbers along the diagonal, things below the diagonal, could be zero for a lower triangle. That's perfectly fine. Now, there are some special types of uh, triangular matrices we want to introduce right now. Uh, if we add the adjective unit in front of a uh, in, in front of a triangular matrix, that means that we're requiring that the diagonal entries be one. So if you look at this upper triangular matrix right here, we say it's unit upper triangular if the diagonal entries have to be one. And similarly, we say that a unit lower triangular matrix, it's a lower triangular matrix, but the diagonal entries have to be one. Unit here describing uh, the multiplicative unit that is one. Uh, we say that a matrix is strictly triangular if the diagonal entries are all zero. So a strictly upper triangular matrix like this, we have diag uh, zeros along the diagonals. So we actually might draw our triangle a little bit smaller, in fact. And strictly lower triangular, you get the same idea. We require zeros along the diagonal right here. And so the non-zeros are only going to be this up or this lower triangular region there. We're not going to worry so much about tri uh, strictly triangular matrices in this lecture. Triangular matrices and unit triangular matrices will be of concern. The strictly ones, strictly triangular ones, we'll talk about a little bit more in the future. Now I should mention that the main reason we want to distinguish between upper and lower triangular. Um, is that, well, the location of the non-zero entries does make a difference. Um, an upper triangular matrix is going to be a square matrix that's essentially a national on form. It's, not, it's basically a new word for one we already had, right? So notice that an upper triangular matrix is going to be a matrix in echelon form, absolutely. Um, a lower triangular matrix would actually be something that's in upside down uh, echelon form. So what, we call it chandelier form or something like that? Uh, I don't know. But... In particular, the, the, it's not an extremely new concept, this idea of upper triangular matrix. Um, I should mention that if something is, of course, upper triangular and lower triangular, that actually makes it a diagonal matrix. Because upper triangular says everything below everything below the diagonal is zero. And upper triangular or lower triangular says everything above the diagonal is zero. So if you put this together, everything except for the diagonal has to be zero. So the intersection of the space of upper triangular and lower triangular matrices is the space of diagonal matrices. And it does turn out that, of course, the, 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 if you take the set of upper triangular matrices, that forms a subspace for, for, our, for our vector space f to the n by n. Uh, why is that? Well, because if you add together two upper triangular matrices, you have zeros below the diagonal. Well, when you add those together, you'll still have zeros below the diagonal. It's closed under addition. Same thing for the lower triangular ones. And if you scale a upper triangular matrix, all of these zeros will still be zeros. C times zero is still zero. Same thing for the lower triangular ones. So these things are closed under linear combinations. Um, just like we saw with the diagonal matrices, if you take the, if you take 
a product of upper triangular matrices, that'll also be upper triangular. If you take the product of lower triangular matrices, that'll also be lower triangular. Unfortunately, if you take the product of an upper triangular and lower triangular, we don't have necessarily any guarantee what's gonna happen there. Uh, it turns out we'll see with the LU factorization that basically every matrix can be factored into a product um, of an upper and lower triangular matrices with some important exceptions. And so the general product is gonna be basically everything, but upper triangular times upper triangular is upper triangular. And same thing can be said for lower triangular. So those, the set, the space of matrices is again closed under matrix addition, scalar multiplication, and matrix multi multiplication, believe it or not. Unit upper triangular matrices do have the property that they're not gonna be closed under scalar multiplication or addition, because if you add or scale these things, you're gonna change the ones along the diagonal. All right, uh, but they do have the property that they close under multiplication. A unit upper triangular times a unit upper triangular is unit upper triangular. Same thing can be said for unit lower triangular matrices. Um, the strictly upper triangular matrices, also much like the upper triangular matrices, they will be closed under addition. If you add two strictly upper triangular matrices together, it'll be strictly upper triangular. Same thing if you scale them, same thing if you multiply them. Um, the same thing can be said for strictly lower triangular matrices as well. And so these, these can be viewed as um, subsets of F to the N by N, which in terms of dimension, um, this one's kind of an interesting argument here. The dimension of the upper triangular matrices is going to be N times N plus 1 over 2. And you might wonder, where in the world did that dimension come from? And the idea is, if you put a little asterisk here, it's like, okay, you have some degrees of freedom going on here. To be upper triangular, you could choose that asterisk to be whatever you want. You have to get zeros everywhere else. And in terms of the dimension, you get something called the triangular numbers, right? If you start taking these, these triangles and you start stacking them on top of each other, you have a line with one, a line with two, a line with three, a line with four, a line, say, with five. And we could keep on making these triangles bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we might ask, how many stars are in this triangle? Well, you're going to get one plus two plus three plus four plus five and just keep on going, right, until you stop with n, if you're n by n. And these are called the triangle numbers, counting number of stars in these triangles. And there's a cute little formula that shows you that the sum of the triangle num or the sum of the consecutive numbers gives you triangle numbers, that's gonna be n times n plus one over two. Um, you actually can see a video right here if you wanna see a proof of this formula for the triangle numbers. Another, another formula you can use is that this right here is, is just n choose two and choose two if you're familiar with the binomial theorem. All right, uh, and so that gives you the dimension of the upper triangular matrices. Uh, like I said, this one's not closed under linear combinations, unit triangular matrices, so it doesn't make a subspace, so we wouldn't talk about dimension. Uh, for strictly tr upper triangular matrices or strictly lower triangular, it's the same basic idea. It's just you only get degrees of freedom off of the diagonal. So you're gonna take n times n plus one over two minus n, which you can then write that as two over, 2n over 2, um, and so then you end up with n, when you combine those together, n squared plus n minus 2n over 2. Fact, uh, simplify, you get n squared minus n over 2, and so your dimension turns out to be n times n minus 1 over 2 dimensional. In case you are interested as these subspaces of uh, these triangular matrices. Um, some other things we should mention about triangular matrices. Uh, an upper triangular matrix uh, can be factored as a product of elementary matrices of replacement type. Uh, now these are gonna be the replacement matrices one uses in the backward phase of the Gaussian Jordan elimination. So these upper triangular matrices correspond to the backwards phase, uh, the back, not the Bach phase, uh, the backwards phase. And likewise, the lower triangular matrices are gonna correspond to the forward phase of Gaussian elimination. And so that's sort of an important distinction here, but in particular, an upper triangular matrix and a lower triangular matrix can be factored. Uh, now, if you take a unit triangular matrix, that can be factored into just replacement matrices. Um, and so unit triangular matrices are gonna be replacement matrices 2.0. Um, upper triangular matrices and lower triangular matrices, this would be if you start combining replacement matrices and scaling matrices together, especially if you allow for zero as part of that. So let's see some examples. Um, here's a matrix A, which is gonna be upper triangular. It's not unit triangular or, nor strictly triangular, but it is an upper triangular matrix. 
Uh, same thing can also be said for B right here. Now it turns out that detecting whether a triangular matrix is singular, non-singular is pretty easy. Uh, much like diagonal entries, we just have to look at the diagonal entries. A, a, a triangular matrix, whether it's upper or lower triangular, it'll be non-singular if and only if its diagonal entries are all non-zero. So we're gonna see that A right here is an example of a non-singular matrix. On the other hand, matrix uh, matrix B, because it does have a zero along its diagonal, it's gonna be a singular matrix. Singular. And so we can compute the, the, we can compute the inverse of A. Um, you're gonna see that the inverse of A, which is also upper triangular, you're gonna get one half, one, and one fourth along the diagonals. You notice those are the reciprocals of the diagonal of A, that's easy. Um, the other numbers are less obvious. And so I'm not gonna present any formula. We can just use the inversion algorithm there. Um, if you wanna take the product of any two uh, upper triangular matrices, you do get something that's upper triangular. Here's for example, A times B. Uh, I'll let you verify that one. And also like I promised, upper triangular matrices can be factored using uh, replacement matrices and perhaps scaling matrices if it's not unit triangular. So the matrix A, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so we can see all of these together. The matrix A can be factored in the following way. So you have a scaling matrix, scale the fourth row by four. You have an upper replacement matrix. This would be one used in the backwards phase. This would look like row one replaced by row one minus five times row three. Here's another backwards phase replacement row two minus three times row three, and then you have a scaling matrix right there, scale the first row by two. That gives us an elementary factorization of A. And you can just find this from just doing row reduction, right? How would you do each of these operations, go through it one by one by one? Since it's upper triangular, you're already starting the backwards phase. You would scale the third row by one fourth, then you'd cancel out these numbers right here, and then you have to scale the first row by one half. And so we get this factorization. Uh, I also want to present a factorization for B. You have to be a little bit more careful when you scale by zero because if you're not careful, scaling by zero can devastate things and destroy them. Um, but this does give you a legitimate factorization. Scale the third row by three. Um, take row one minus two times row two. Take row two minus, sorry, this one was, take. Uh, you take row one minus two times row three. This one is row two minus five times row three. This, you're gonna scale the second row by zero. Then you're gonna take the first row minus row two and then scale the first row by three. And that gives you a factorization into air quote elementary matrices. Technically speaking, this is not an elementary matrix uh, because multiplying by zero is not, a, that, that's a singular matrix right there. Uh, but that's because this matrix right here is singular as well. So every non-singular matrix can be factored in, can be factored to a product of elementary matrices. Since B was singular, at least one of the factors in this factorization cannot be elementary. Uh, and so this is what we this is what we call a projection matrix, something we'll talk about later in this series. And singular matrices, when you factor them, will have to have some type of projection going on into it. Uh, it's an example of an eigenpotent matrix. Again, something we'll talk about uh, a little bit later in this lecture series.